Hi, and welcome to another episode of Piano TV. So today we are going to talk about the genre of ragtime, which I find interesting because it's a genre of music that originated in the USA. And a lot of genres that we talk about here on this channel and in music history in general have their origins in European music. So it kind of just shifts the focus a little bit. I also like ragtime because it's a piano specific genre. Even though ragtime music has been adapted to other instruments, it started as a piano genre. So just a couple brief points on ragtime music first before we really get into this. So ragtime comes from the word ragged music, which basically just means syncopated music. And it was popular at the end of the 19th century, early 20th century. So we're looking at like the late 1800s, early 1900s. Ragtime music enjoyed about 25 years of popularity until it was overtaken by jazz music. So anyway, in this video, what we're gonna talk about is the origin of ragtime music, what it sounds like, and we're gonna talk about some of the influential ragtime composers and listen to some examples. So let's get started. Okay, so what exactly is ragtime music? Well, it's a piano-based genre, and the music is fast and syncopated, which is like what ragged kind of means. It's ragged music, you play it with a little bit of a ragged rhythm. And the right hand generally does all the crazy rhythms, and the left hand usually has like a steady beat going on here. Now, it's, it's not a complicated syncopated rhythm, but it is syncopated. Ragtime harmonic patterns are also fairly simple, and they do a lot of like tonic, subdominant, and dominant movements. So for example, like this piece I have in front of you here is in the key of C major. So you're gonna see like a lot of G chords. Um, you got one like here, um, probably later on too. C chords and F chords, that would be like one, four, five, a lot of those. And I mean, some others sprinkled in there, but those are gonna be like your main harmonic anchors. And unlike some jazz, the way ragtime music was written on the page was exactly how it should be played. Uh, and it has that in common with classical music. You don't embellish it, you don't modify it. Ragtime is also generally pretty hard to play. And I mean, anyone who's attempted to play Scott Joplin's Maple Leaf Rag, or even like this, what I got in front of you here, it's it's really tough. The idea is to play with like this machine-like precision, but there's a lot of big leaps and a lot of octaves and stuff that make it extremely difficult to do that. The ragtime music became popular and spread all the way across America. Its central hub was in the state of Missouri. And in Missouri, they even do an annual Scott Joplin Ragtime Festival because Joplin lived and taught there for a while. He also lived, he lived in uh, Sedalia where the festival is held, and he also lived in St. Louis, the larger city. So if you haven't heard of Scott Joplin yet, don't worry about that. We'll be talking about him in a minute since he is the most famous name of ragtime. St. Louis, Missouri was a popular center for ragtime. Since it's located in the central USA, it was a hub for travelers of all kinds and a piano player could make a decent living performing at bars and clubs there. I mean, they might not be rolling in the dough or anything, but it can make enough to get by. But since music is an ever evolving beast with one genre leading into the next, what forms inspired the creation of ragtime? Or put another way, what was the musical landscape like in the Americas at the end of the 19th century? Banjo playing was popular in the Americas and a lot of people started playing the piano, like they would play the banjo and that type of style influenced ragtime. We also had syncopated styles like the famous cakewalk dance, which was considered a precursor for ragtime music as well. And then you had the fiddle music and dances from the British Isles like Britain and Scotland and Ireland things like jigs and fast dances. Ragtime was a transient genre. It was popular before recorded music became available, meaning it was mainly distributed uh, via sheet music. So you'd hear it performed at bars and clubs, but you could also like buy the published sheet music. And this is something it had in common with classical music before it. But the sound of ragtime was evolving away from the classical sound, and it can be seen as a precursor to jazz, which came afterwards. With jazz, the musical landscape changed even further in the advent of musical recordings. When we talk about influential composers of ragtime music, we have to talk about the, the big three. These are the three men who we call the greats of ragtime. So they would be Scott Joplin, who we're gonna talk about first, and then we have Joseph Lamb and James Scott. So these were composers who enjoyed popularity and they wrote high level ragtime music, not the cheap imitation ragtime that you know, came along with the whole package. So let's start this off by talking about Scott Joplin. He was an African-American songwriter and piano player, like all these ragtime greats, and born in 1867 in Texas, although he later lived in Missouri where 
which was kind of like the hub of ragtime music. He grew up as a railway laborer, but he was lucky enough to have a musical family and good teachers who helped him out because he was able to travel around the South as a musician after deciding as an adult that hard physical labor wasn't his cup of tea. So he moved to Sedalia, Missouri, later lived in St. Louis as well. Um, and he taught piano for a living, you know, training future ragtime stars, no big deal. And he also started publishing music when he lived in Missouri. And in 1899, he got a publishing deal with his song, Maple Leaf Rag, which became basically like the quintessential ragtime piece. Most people have heard it. it basically the most famous ragtime song that exists. We're gonna listen to a quick clip of the Maple Leaf Rag, and I want you to pay attention to the very steady left hand combined with sort of that syncopated, bouncier, lighter right hand. In Sedalia, there was a club called the Maple Leaf Club, and that's actually where the name of this song came from because it was a club that Joplin went to, and he named his song after that, the Maple Leaf Rag. <laughs> Joplin moved around some more to St. Louis and New York, and he spent the remainder of his life trying to break out of the rank time box that he had been put in due to popularity. He composed other things like operas, but never really had a lot of success with them. So in 1917, he died because of syphilis, and with him, ragtime sort of died too. That was that was basically the end of ragtime, the beginning of jazz. Then we have Joseph Lem, the second of the big three. He was born about 20 years later than Joplin, and he was born in the East Coast, so he wasn't anywhere nearby like the main scene of ragtime, but he was still deeply influenced by it. And as a self-taught piano player, he was super passionate about Joplin's music. So in 1907, his like fanboy fantasies came to life and he met Joplin in New York City. Joplin was impressed with Flem's music. So Joplin was like, hey, I'm going to hook you up with my publisher. And then Joseph Flem had the same publisher and stayed with him for about a decade. So around the time of Joplin's death in 1917 and at the end of the ragtime era, Lamb was kind of like, well, you know what? Let's just make this music thing a hobby. I'm going to be an accountant instead. The song I want to show you by Joseph Lamb is his Sensation Rag. This is the one that he performed for Scott Joplin in person in 1908, the one that got him referred to Joplin's publicist and allowed for you know him to compose more and enjoy more fame. Joseph Lamb's rags aren't super, super complex, but they're highly organized. He was one of those musicians musicians who believed in melody first and complexity second. So as a listener, it's not like going to be really emotionally investing music, but it's very, very listenable and accessible. And the last of the big three is James Scott. So he was a talented piano player and composer who lived in Missouri, just like Scott Joplin. And like Joseph Lamb, James Scott was born about 20 years after Joplin and he was like, you know, Joplin was his idol. So in 1905, he actually went on a little travel adventure or supposedly, this isn't like, a confirmed fact, but okay. So supposedly he traveled to St. Louis to meet up with Joplin and play some rags for him. And just like with Joseph Lamb, Joplin was like, hey, you're pretty good kid. And then he recommended James Scott to his publisher. So Scott was a composer. He composed a bunch of famous rags. He became a music teacher. And one thing that he mainly did to earn an income was performing at silent movies. But when sound movies started becoming a thing in the early 1930s, that kind of pushed him out of his main source of income of performing a silent movie. So he died a lot more broken destitute than he lived. Scott wrote a song called the Frog Legs Rag, which enjoyed immense popularity. It wasn't quite as popular as Scott Joplin's Maple Leaf Rag, but it was definitely like way up there. And this is one of his earlier compositions, but I wanted to show it to you because this is the one he 
maybe perform for Joplin to get a publishing deal, kind of like Lamb, who we were just talking about. And it gives you a sense of his clear and uh, energetic songwriting style. Ragtime music wasn't just confined to the USA either. European composers like Dvorak, Debussy, um, and some others, Eric Satie, were influenced by it in their own music. A good example of this is Debussy's Gollywog's Cakewalk, which is from his collection called uh, Children's Corner, and it was written in 1913. Now, cakewalks were pretty similar to rags. We already kind of mentioned them a little bit. They were more of like a ragtime precursor. You should definitely listen to Gollywog's Cakewalk. We won't, it's beyond the scope of the video to do a clip of that now, especially because it doesn't pertain specifically to ragtime, but it's really good. You should look it up. Like any new and exciting musical genre, is not everyone is going to be singing its praises. It's kind of like, you know, Marilyn Manson in the 1990s. Everyone thought he was like satanic and all that, like it was evil music. The same was said about Ragtime when it first came out. It was considered by some to be musical poison and being able to find its way into the brains of the youth to such an extent as to arouse one's suspicions of their sanity. So basically it just goes to show that no matter what generation you are living in, new and exciting music is often considered evil until it becomes more mainstream. Though Ragtime fell out of popularity around 1920, being replaced by the wilder, more adventurous jazz styles, Ragtime didn't disappear into obscurity forever. In the 1970s, Ragtime music was revived by performers and movies. So one thing that happened to Ragtime over the years was that it sort of became caricaturized. You had this art form that was then watered down for mass consumption, as tends to happen, and then it became parodied over the years so that no one ever, no one considered it a serious genre of music anymore, like in the 40s, 50s. Typical impressions of ragtime music would involve playing on an out of tube piano, playing way too fast, making lots of mistakes, and so on. But in the 1970s, there was a guy named Joshua Rifkin, and he recorded an album called Piano Rags by Scott Joplin. And he approached it like a classical piano player and treated the genre with actual respect. And this album became really popular, helped um, popularize ragtime in mass culture again. And then other things as well helped repopularize ragtime like the 1974 movie called The Sting, which used and featured the music of Scott Joplin. It's actually from this movie that the Scott Joplin song, The Entertainer became famous, which you've probably heard before. And we may or may not be looking at in the next video. Because of these revitalizing efforts and many others of its ilk, ragtime is a genre most of us have heard of even nowadays in modern times. And that is all for today's video on ragtime. Hopefully this gave you a good introduction on the style, what it's supposed to sound like, and some of the influential people who developed ragtime and made it popular. And just a little like spoiler alert for the next video, we're gonna be looking at one of Scott Joplin's songs as a tutorial, so this is kinda like in preparation of that. Anyway, thank you for watching this video. If you liked it, definitely make sure you subscribe and send this video a like and yeah without further ado I will catch you next time ah why that's the eraser that's the eraser no